So I was one of the a number of the students that uh, kind of went through the whole SME program. I went through uh, undergrad there, and I kind of did you know kind of normal computer science nerd stuff, studied math. Um, I was really I'm really into programming languages, which is also super nerdy. Um, and I came here to get to the game industry, and um, I am. Um, so that's at least one good uh, proof of that this program is very much worth it. Um, and as kind of you mentioned, that uh, I probably uh, want to, wanted to make Squirrel crawl his hair more than ever than any other student, probably just with uh, the kind of complexity I put in. <laughs> um, but it was a very good experience. Um, and now I am a core slash client engineer at Battlecry, and that enables me to do what I've always wanted to do, which is really crazy, because when I started thinking about well, what, I wanna, what do I want to do, I was playing like RPGs when I was younger, um, FPS games, action adventure, some mixture there in between, that I was like, what do I want to do? Do I really want to work on gameplay? Not really, I mean, gameplay's fun, and I like playing games that are fun to play, um, the, whose mechanics that are sound and engaging and have a lot of replayability to them. But um, I was always kind of um, mystified and kind of turned on to what is underlying the game itself, what powers the game. Um, how are the game graphics to the screen? Um, how can I break it? <laughs> um, and so, I kind of, it's kind of weird that my first job, and I'm still in it, um, was basically an engine programmer. Um, and so, what I get to do every day is talk to various disciplines, level design, art, um, within the programming team, especially with gameplay. Um, we're always talking, and I get to basically put in features, fix things in the engine that came to us from other, from as a legacy as inheritance, but um, so it's really cool that I guess I get to be such an integral part of the team that even though if I spent months working on something and no one even notices it because it's something in the background or if it's some feature that actually gets used so that you know the sky can look a particular way or a particular um, hair shader has a particular look to it. Um, and no one really notices it, but uh, it doesn't matter to me because I'm not really looking forward to what people, um, what I can point to is just the fact that I was able to help others do their job effectively, hopefully. <laughs> so what am I here to really even talk about? Um, I want to kind of bring up, we have art, LD, SD, and production here. Um, I want to also throw it to mix quality assurance QA. Um, I want to talk about how these disciplines and how these roles in the whole process of making a game is extremely important um, and why you should care that they all exist. Not just that, oh, we need programmers because um, they maintain the editor or that, well, because, just because it's software. Um, but no, why are they there? Not just because it runs on a computer, but there are other reasons as well. Um, or level design, like, you know, um, level design is very important. Design, game design is a very important aspect of making a game. Um, if you don't have a good, solid foundation, mechanics-wise, then you're just going to be inviting yourself to a little hurt, which I know all of us have experienced one degree or another here, and there are your own experiences. Um, so I wanted to just kind of throw into the mix a couple of really well-known, I hope, games. Um, so just think about what comes into your mind when I, when you see these pictures, when you think about the gameplay experiences that you have with these games. Super Mario Bros. 3, classic. StarCraft 2, can't really call it a classic, but it's certainly popular. Um, and it seems to have garnered enough respect over the StarCraft crowd um, that I'd say it's a pretty reasonably successful successor to the original, which most people theorize could not have been done. Um, Final Fantasy VII uh, kind of perhaps gets too much credence, gets too much popularity, or maybe it's had its popularity for a reason. 
Um, and what we work on, again, kind of similar in that vein. Why is it popular? Um, so, I guess I want to, um, please, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. I'm, I want this to be super uh, casual, and this is in the class, and I really thank you for being here on a Friday when you don't have to be here, and you're, aren't you guys done like next week or the week after? Yeah, so you basically are done and you're crunching, so why are you here? I don't know. But thank you. <laughs> um, so, can you think of any similarities between all these games other than they're popular? They seem pretty disparate, huh? Very different. One's a platformer, one's a stra real time strategy game, one's a role playing game, and one's an MMORPG. <laughs> they're all, yeah, they're okay. Uh, World of Warcraft, not really. I don't mean that specific expansion. Not, 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 not that has he made Warcraft, Warcraft, Warcraft 3, Warcraft 3 was pretty, had, had, its, had its day. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't really mean the IP itself, but these okay. particular <coughs> titles and not specific right. expansions, but just right. the basic game. Sorry. Uh, they all require downloads due to various effects, either through damage in Final Fantasy, Starcraft, or was um, Drain or Warcraft in general, or say in Super Mario, you didn't know um, you made, made it balance in terms of gameplay wise. Is that true? Yeah. That's definitely a good aspect, yeah. Anything else? A lot of play tests you don't know before. Yeah. How about. They all, to one degree or another, share the, the aspect that they're either single player or multiplayer games, and either online or offline games. But there's a degree of weight in, in the sense in which you can share the experience with another person directly through playing with them in the same session, either locally or online, or um, you can share that experience in person, either like couch gaming whatever, um, but that there's a difference fundamentally between the fact that Super Mario Bros. 3 is designed as a single player game, but it has a multiplayer component in which you can have two people locally playing on the same console. Um, StarCraft 2, can't really have people playing together locally, but other than land, but um, in the sense in which you know, you're on the same exact machine. Um, but you can play online, you can play um, socially, um, certainly the esports aspect and um, kind of commentating on gameplay, that aspect of it as well. Um, Final Fantasy VII, I put that in there intentionally because I knew that that would, um, it is something that's very much single player, like I pop it in the machine and here I go for X number of hours just by myself, basically. Um, World of Warcraft is obviously a huge multiplayer game. Um, now, they, the, the fundamental, the commonality is that they were all designed for a particular purpose. They were all designed to um, leverage the fact that they were specific types of titles. Like Super Mario Bros. 3, designed to be a fun platformer. Um, StarCraft 2, designed to be an engaging, a deep, mechanically speaking, uh, <coughs> RTS game. Um, that they knew that they were trying to keep, la keep hold of that community that they made it with each other. Um, Final Fantasy VII, designed to be a narrative-driven game. Designed, not, doesn't really have, by any stretch of imagination, um, really any deep gameplay mechanics. I mean, um, it's pretty obvious what you can and you can't do, and there's lots of ways to exploit the gameplay. Um, but it's about, for them, it's definitely about that first experience that you had playing throughout the game as a whole, as a whole thing. Um, and War World of Warcraft, definitely, a online game, the strengths are to um, have fun gameplay, yes, but to engage people and for a common goal um, and to keep them playing for as long as possible. Um, now, uh, anything, anyone have any comments? Disagree? No, oh, come on, let's call it. <laughs> All right, live on. Um, so there are some impacts that you have when you're designing in online only versus 
but say I'll make it for a while. I'm just going to take, completely take off the table single player. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to completely take off the table the, the single player games right now. Um, because I think we can safely state that an online capable game has in some degree, it must have, therefore, some degree of single playerness. Like, uh, if it's offline, then there has to be some amount to which you can play by yourself, and so it has to be designed around that. Um, whether it's Call of Duty, and you know, you can argue which part of the series is more geared toward the single player experience than became the multiplayer experience. Um, then you can argue some of the other some other games that feel like the multiplayer experience was just tacked on the end just because they felt like they had to have multiplayer in the game for marketing reasons. Um, so. I want to speak to how do those decisions impact, impact rather, um, what you can and cannot do in the design experience. Um, so let's talk about level flow, how players interact with the environment itself. Um, is there, can anyone think of why you may have to design uh, online something uh, in a world, let's say, a, a town that's going to have PvP going on in an MMO, um, how you design that space versus a space that's very much similar, a town, in a game where you're hiding behind cover and shooting enemies. Back. Um, so if it's going to have a lot of shooting and you're going to need Cover, I, obviously, I guess there's gonna be a lot more clutter, and just not just I mean, I'm just using that word, but like yeah. things to actually use strategically, and then the other one was what, like a P PvP, like MMO, or yeah, think about like an MMO. I kind of describe similar environment, but different contexts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be more open, I guess, from what I've seen, like the experiences that I've had. So like, I mean, if it's top down, you're not really using the cover in that way. So the Matt would just really have the buildings and the um, paths laid out pretty obviously. Alright, that's good. Anything else? How about um, what the player should and should not be able to do in that space? Is it really a big deal if in a single player game like Call of Duty, um, in a campaign mode that you can get out of the play space and roam around and kill yourself because you went outside of the volume that they never expected to go out of and the game crashes or whatever. Um, versus an MMO where you'd be able to do the same thing but maybe it has greater ramifications because you it, you go to a place that uh, they don't intend anyone to see, maybe it has Easter eggs that they could be liable that they could be pulled liable for because it has legal content in it or something. Or if it actually unveils a part of an unfinished level, perhaps. Um, so that's one aspect. That's another aspect in which flow can design around flow um, can be very important between those two. Um, any other aspects of how a player can navigate? Or let's say, <coughs> how, what about um, the gameplay itself? Um, in a single player, World War II shooter, um, you're going to be focusing people towards specific points, right? You want to advance the narrative, a storyline. Is what about an online game? What about an MMO? Is there really that sense in it? Um, what about if there isn't? What about MMOs that are more have more single playerish feeling um, campaigns to them, kind of like. Guild Wars 2 or Guild Wars or um, Final Fantasy kind of they do this to some degree. I don't know if they're super successful in that. I think that's subjective on my part. Um, how about a uh, same scenario? Um, now let's switch. It to <coughs> well, if in an MMO. Um, where you can be positionally has great impact on the actual gameplay itself. So for example, maybe there are certain volumes that you, which if you're inside of them, it's like a capture point, um, or they 
or if you hold this capture point for a certain amount of time, and you get the other team gets beneficial effects based off of that. So let's say the defending team gets a death bonus of like plus 100 or whatever, whatever that means on the trailing for that gameplay system. Uh, then if you can trick the game in some sense to be part of that and not actually be there, that's obviously very detrimental. Um, or the fact that you have to design the level thinking about, well, wait, I can't just put this car right here in the middle because I know um, due to various, whatever reason there could be, uh, maybe it's technical, maybe it's more related, maybe it's just time, because that's a huge thing in, in the real world especially. You don't have forever to make the game, unfortunately, um, which you guys well aware of. <laughs> um, that aspect of it, um, that if you place this car here, and you know it can be an obstruction, it can limit the player's line of sight, and it's, let's say it's not destructible, so it's there, it's fixed permanently. Um, then this car being there, what if it impacts the spawning of, where, of new players? Um, I'm just saying, this MMO maybe has like respawning capabilities, essentially. <coughs> Um, are there any other, I guess, concepts related to um, navigation and preventing or prohibiting um, or permitting players to go to specific parts of the level? So, yes, and you sort of hinted at this, one is certainly uh, cheating in the sense of if I cheat and do something that's uh, maybe not intended in a single player, I'm only robbing, stealing for myself. If I do that in a multiplayer community, I undermine the entire game. Another is if uh, the whole game is narrative flow based of trying to draw my attention forward to this and forward to that, I can have ancillary things that aren't flushed out as much, but in an MMO, people are going to peek under every rock, and so yeah. it's kind of random access on the level of detail for the yeah. It's like a town, it's like a Call of Duty, FPS, uh, the gameplay is going to be kind of circular, and there's going to be paths throughout that. Whereas an MMO is like a world that kind of goes on forever. So, I don't know. You'd have to construct it to direct people in those types of ways. Yeah. Yeah. How about, now let's, less game mechanics now. How about art, performance, programming? Um, in an MMO, you, you have particular areas that you know the player's going to see, and you want this, them to see the, the lovely detail that you put in there. The, vast amount of detail that you put in. Um, but in a, in a very similar situation with um, like the Call of Duty where, where it's basically, I don't want to say corridor shooter, but um, <coughs> if, it, if you know you're going along specific near, near, linear paths throughout levels, um, then you know that you can focus players' attention to certain parts. You can make them see what you want them to see um, by orienting battles in specific areas. But then you know that because of that knowledge, you can now make specific performance decisions out of that. So you can say, well, I can, I now I can say, well, I don't need to draw a distance. Um, this specific section would be very far because well, they'll never even see that within their purview of their camera. Um, or how about making environments feel lifelike? You want um, basically relatively dumb AI uh, for like ants and you know, birds and bees and all that stuff, just fauna, um, fate and other types of wildlife that you want the game to feel like it has a personality that has a life to it. Um, but those things in reality still, they cost, they cost stuff. They cost something, um, whether it's performance or time and actually creating the assets themselves. Um, so in an MMO, you have so much more content that you have to pack in there and you have to be more aggressive with how you're going to optimize for specific cases. So, um, in, that, in that same way, uh, think of building. That seems like very innocuous, a building, right? Like if I, if I model this building and we know we're gonna be very up and close to it and I, people are gonna go inside it and maybe it's gonna be a home point area. So you can set your home point there, your, your base location. Um, so it's gonna be something that's well traveled. Well, you're, one, you're gonna want that to be extremely high detail. You're gonna want it to have lots of 
little um, just knickknacks everywhere. You want to have a good amount of clutter, but not really cluttered. You don't want it to seem like people are randomly jamming stuff in there. No visible seams. No, no visible seams, yeah. Um, Recently noticed that on Dragon Age, there's a visible seam in one of the castles. Oh, over. And that's uh, a place that you go to quite a bit. So I was like, I don't know how that got through, but put it in a shadow or something. Um, how about, well, we, we have that building, but uh, we can't always render that building at that same detail all the time, because you're going to want to see that in distance for the magnificence of it. Let's say it's a huge castle or something. We want it. We want to have its its presence visible at all times when you're within a certain vicinity of the area. So if you're at, you're like in an auction house or in a perch overlooking something, you want to see it. So you're not going to be. You're going to have to make certain decisions about. Well, now we're going to level, levels of detail, and well, how much do you put into that level of detail and still maintain the integrity that you were promising the player and how the game will perform? Because um, MMOs, I don't know, it kills me when you're just when it's super framey and it, there's a large variations in the, in the frame rate, um, it can really impact the player experience negatively. Um, even if it's not a game that, like, most MMOs don't require a lot of which feedback. Um, there, certainly there are instances of raids and you know um, subsets of the experience as a whole that do, but not, generally speaking, <coughs> Um, as you're just you know traversing the landscape, um, whereas in your Call of Duties or um, your Legend of Zelda's, where that's kind of in the middle ground, I think, where you can have battles um, that are that I don't know, depends on what you want to do. Um, I don't think it's a very complex gameplay system either, but um, certainly there is a difference between the performance characteristics of one game versus another and what you're willing to sacrifice. Um, I'd say for, sir, yeah. So, like, when you were talking about the, like, the uh, first-person shooter type game versus the MMO, would it also be a thing, like, would, would a performance call be, like, during the first-person shooter? Like, since you know gameplay is going to mostly happen in certain areas, like, you wouldn't, uh, like the, the, the amount of detail you put into the environment in certain places will be different. Like exactly. the focus you're on. Okay. Yeah. Even even more to that, you can just like hack off entire parts of it and not render it, or just not have it exist at all because you know that they'll. There is no logic. There is no feasible reason why, in the course of normal gameplay, that they would ever see that facade mm -hmm. or the, the missing facade rather. Um, and then I'd also say, you know. First person game in particular, the primary activity, player activity is aiming. Yep. Uh, tends to be. And aiming is directly negatively impacted by even slightly <coughs> negative frame rate. Mm -hmm. Whereas tactical decisions of arm this spell, fire this spell are far less so. so. Definitely. That's great. Any other thoughts? Oh, sorry, yeah, I didn't see your hand. No, no, it's fine. Uh, as a designer, too, one of the big things when you're doing online versus offline or I guess online capable, you have your performance uh, profile has to account for the hundreds of people that can be in that space, potentially be in that space when you're online versus something that's single player or that's severely multiplayer limited, like only four people. That's that's only four extra models versus the hundred or thousands of extra models that you have to account for within the space. Yeah, that's um, an excellent point. Um, okay, how about let's say we have a level, again, same town, it's, it looks beautiful, we have it performing optimally across all platforms, it's great. We can have 200 people in the vicinity without going below 60, let's say. It's, it's top notch. Now, let's say because of some of the decisions you made, there is no longer go there because um, let's say after a period of a month, the uh, player the drop off rate of how many players visit that space has increasingly diminished, despite the fact that you put quests there or specific things that they have to go there to do, but they hate going there because of X, Y, and Z. Um, let's say one of the decisions you made was 
and I don't know why you did this, but um, you play a cutscene, like you have your, you lock the camera in some grandiose cutscene as you go through a, um, an elevator that you rise up to like the top of a house or something. This is like some weird steampunk game. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you go to the top of the castle, and you're seeing this grand view of the landscape and the environment, but they have to sit through a 20, 25 second cutscene to do it, and they really, they just want to get in and get out as fast as possible because, let's face it, in an MMO, like, you just want to tr go through the environment as quickly as you can. You want to get in and get out. Um, Similar thing, maybe in an FPS. Um, you made a similar decision, knowing that you're gonna okay, we're gonna focus the player toward this building because something big is gonna happen there. But every time, every time they have to replay that scene, every time they have to go to that space, they have to replay that sequence either um, because it's so important that it. It's a specific gameplay event that triggers it, or because it's just because that they replayed it again and again and again. Not knowing that they wanted to see the sequence they saw the first time was great, but you decided to make a design decision to force them to do that so that you could do loading in the background or something, so that you could load stuff in and um, try to minimize the time that they're waiting, but in reality, they're, they are waiting. They're just waiting frustratingly. Um, Kind of unbeknownst to them, they'd rather have a loading bar, basically. At least they know that they're they're not in control, whereas they're giving this this feel, this guy is that they're in control, but not really. So you're saying that like during online play, when <coughs> taking away control from a player, cinematics, things like this are typically not uh, good ideas, or yeah, um, unless you have a really good reason for it, cutscenes specifically for narrative elements like campaigns and stuff, um, probably okay. But I'd say in, it's my opinion that whenever you take game control away from the player, that is the point, the reason why they played the game in the first place, right. um, to interact with it. Um, so yeah. yeah like, it, it does make more sense in, uh, than in a single player than where also, I don't understand how you would have that kind of link up between. There'd also be that whole logistical thing where you're having like a cutscene or like control taken away from everybody simultaneously. I don't yeah. know, and having that link up. Yeah, not simultaneously, but just for that person that's playing. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah not not at. Sorry, my apologies. Um, not everyone would see the cutscene or experience that, but if they are going to the elevator, they get into the elevator, then they see that cutscene. Oh, they okay. use that as a proof as a point to say, okay, we know that they're going to be here, so we can load in a bunch of stuff um, that uh, will take a really long time, or you know, cut stuff off. But the problem is, my fictitious elevator intentionally was focused toward what they can see, and that this it's not a, a very secluded space; it's more open and. Um, there are some of those out there. Um, the Final Fantasy mode, well, Eleven is pretty egregious with uh, the cutscenes. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, any other, I guess, thoughts on that? The, the reason why I listen them separately, but I think there is a sense in which all of these points are actually interconnected. Um, that you can't really talk about flow without really impacting the environment and vice versa. If you make a decision on how you're going to design for the environment toward a particular end, then it's going to impact some of these others. Um, you can't, the, the trick is going to be obviously to how do you balance, you know, how does the, the art, the artist, the, the, the really passionate environment artist going to get his, you know, his say in the matter, what he, what he really wants, and then the lead gameplay designer saying no, but we, but I really need this. Um, that's that that um, that balance. It, it's especially tricky. Okay. Okay. So 
when you're, I guess, when you're, when you're going through some of these, um, when you feel like you got a solution, you're like, man, I feel like I'm awesome. Like, I, I chose this video picture for you. Um, that, like, man, I, I'm, I'm like the most powerful thing out there. Like, I, I'm awesome, right? Um, you feel like you're the king of the world, the queen of the world, whatever. Um, and you feel like you solve the biggest problem and nothing's gonna stop you. That's the worst thing you can say. <laughs> um, as soon as you think you have the perfect solution, um, 10 more problems show why it's not. Um, and that's when you look more like this. <laughs> that, um, yeah, he's pouring water from the ocean <laughs> through a bitter Brita filter. That's nonsense. Is actually the subtitle for that. Um, but uh, my point here is that when you think of ways to solve problems, whatever your discipline is, if it's art and you need to figure out a good way to optimize this model, if it's level design for the for gameplay reasons, or programming for performance reasons, or for uh, including a specific gameplay mechanic, that you really need to think through all the ramifications of that <coughs> solution. Um, as well as you can, obviously we don't have foresight perfect, you can't predict the future. Um, so as well as you can, investigate the different outcomes that could result from your decisions and how that could positively and negatively in fact impact everyone else. So for example. Yeah. So when you're, these decisions seem like, that you're talking about seem like pretty big decisions. That, so are you most likely well, in a position that's where... Not, not necessarily true, is that oh. you could be implementing a, something simple as a grapple mechanic. Uh -huh. Say that. Let's say you you want people to traverse through a level pretty pretty fast, um, and you want it to be fun. Um, how you design that solution could impact the gameplay insofar as well. Should they be able to participate in combat while they're being grappled? Um, how long will the grapple take? Will it be instantaneous? How many seconds will it take? Um, while they're grappling, um, are we going to be Playing animation probably is that going to be specifically um, how is that going to impact it? Are you going to be relying on specific parts of the skeleton of that animation to exist in order to implement this? Um, from the programming side, um, are you going to do it in a way that is very? Are you going to make a solution that is very so much? geared toward the purpose of grappling, that if we decide not to grapple at all, that your work that you've just done for the last whatever month or two, I would say it takes two months, that period of time is completely washed out. You have nothing that you can use. Um, so I, I, I would suggest that even, not every decision, obviously, but I think that there is a sense in which many decisions that you will end up making, they, they have ripple effects, they have impacts, that can change the course, not dramatically necessarily, because if you're the director of blah, 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 then obviously you have more immediate decisions that are gonna make huger impacts immediately. But I think over the course of development, definitely. Okay. That's definitely my experience too. And just even two more examples of that. One, with your grapple, now you can progress through the level space more quickly than anticipated, so the level streaming, which was always able to get ahead of you now, can't. And now you come around the corner and it's stuttering and you see the void. Or you're, you have some great idea and you stay up over the weekend and you code up a weather system, which is awesome. But now you come back in the morning and in your RPG, the blacksmith and his wife are having a conversation in the middle of a downpour and now the game feels less immersive, right? Mm -hmm. Because of this cool thing you added. So everything has these chain effect mm -hmm. ramifications to it. That's great. Anyone else have any, I guess, popular? Yeah, I mean, and especially to go on the online versus offline or something, uh, we have to think about this. Is that mechanic, you can talk about our animations and stuff, is that firing locally? Is it in the server? Is it being replicated across all players? If it's happening locally, can some player figure out a way to cheese that and use it for their advantage versus another player? 
um, I think but it just compounds the problem when you're talking about online development as well, especially. So like when you have, if you were to realize that this that this could happen, you do you like do you typically uh, flesh out a few different ways of tackling that beforehand, or I mean, is it always that something that you would realize, or, is it, or have you worked through something and realize, oh, I shouldn't have done it that way? Um, it depends, unfortunately. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be just, well, it depends on, one, the culture of the studio to work at. So, I am very grateful to work in a place where um, iteration is very important. So, you're constantly seeing how the changes that you're making and what even small changes um, can impact the game. Um, so, you're refining it more and more and more and more. Um, so you so you can start to see maybe the first time you did you did you implemented grapple for, for example, um, you didn't know you didn't think about the fact that well in this online game, um, well you can actually have you can only you can totally cheese it so that I grapple five times faster than anyone else. Um, like this is an oversight, right? Mm -hmm. um, things like that, they start to creep up during actual iteration, actually through the play, the test process, that you're starting to get more and more hands on that particular feature that starts to expose its flaws. Um, and obviously, there, there may be times when you work on something and it's decided that, well, yeah, we don't really want grapple, so we're just going to cut it. Um, again, it comes back to well, you want to you want to make sure that at least you can maybe you can if, if you're the artist that made that particular model or whatever, maybe you can't reuse it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can use it as like a kind of knickknack or something. Maybe it looks like high techy enough to where it could be like a kind of mm -hmm. like a car. I don't know. Um, kind of reason in some way, right? Um, but I think. The, just the process, just the error process, kind of feedback loop coming back into itself, which is actually, that's like, huh, um, hmm. where when you're developing something, you have like this, this idea that you're conceptualizing, you're, you're thinking about what is going to be, what are the demands on me for this, but what's the design for it? And then, what's the practical limitations? Like, how much, how much time do I have to do this, first of all? Um, is it high priority? That's another thing, right? Um, that you guys especially have the pressure of time more than a lot of people. Um, and you have to consider, is this feature that, we're, that we won really going to make a huge impact on the game. And if it does, how much time are we willing to spend to figure that out or to verify that or to just go with it and see what happens? Um, those are the decisions that obviously are made by people with power. <laughs> um, so, but in TGPs and Capstone especially, um, when you decide that, you know what, really big in jumping, you just have to have jumping, jumping's going to be part of our game in some in some way. So you so you design around it, basically. Um, you make decisions that we're going to, okay, we're going to design certain parts of the levels where we're going to use jumping as a premier mechanic to solve this puzzle or to show this particular part of the level or to um, show that you can interact with the combat in this very specific way. Where it's like, oh, we can do um, Special combat, some special combos that originate while you're doing, while you're jumping. So you like jump from ledge and initiate a combat or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, sorry, I completely <laughs> lost my uh, with that part of the question. But um, it, yeah, sorry, did I answer your question? <laughs> okay, sweet. Um, so. Feedback is highly critical to at least don't 
I would say <coughs> encourage you to listen to feedback, um, especially feedback that you disagree with. Actually, I would say pay more attention to feedback that you disagree with just to see if we're really thinking like, well, are they saying it because they have some particular grudge against that type of gameplay? Do they just hate that gameplay? Well, that's certainly a valid, like, I I dislike sports games, like playing sports games. I like playing basketball in real life or playing soccer or whatever, but I can't stand the actual act of sitting down and playing like a matter or something. I don't know. It just doesn't appeal to me in any way. Um, or as, and it might be it might be the complete opposite for someone that does enjoy doing that, but really hates puzzle games. So there's that aspect. Um, but look at the feedback that you have. Um, seeing why would they say that? Are they are they saying it because they want to make your product better, or are they want to make it worse? Well, probably chances are they want to play it. So why would they be giving feedback in the first place? If they if they spend the time to give you feedback. Just give a reason for that. Um, and I'm sort of not, internet trolls are internet trolls. Let's keep it to um, the context of you solicited feedback um, through whether it's through guild hall or you talk to someone on the street and said, hey, we have to roll about this game. It's really cool. Come check it out. Tell us what you think. OK. Chances are that person doesn't hate you. <laughs> right? They don't even know you. So, um, listen to feedback. I know it's really easy to pay attention to feedback that's that's uh, that's fulfilling. That's like, yes, I made the right decision. It's it's awesome. Um, but pay attention to the critical feedback as well um, to make sure that maybe that that what they're saying has some value, and it probably does, more than likely. Um, also, the the again, I know I hate. The business, like, kind of speak of it, but um, in reality, what's the cost? Either my time, the value that you're getting. What's what's the value per time measurement that you're getting for implementing that feature for the game, whether it's a mechanical, you know, whatever it is. Um, also, not strictly time, but the cost of how much will that feature impact performance, perhaps? Um, maybe in an MMO, you can't really. MMOs, there's some really beautiful MMOs out there, but let's be honest, when you're making an MMO, you cannot make the same decisions that you're going to make when you know that this game is going to be an FPS and it's going to be, there's no online component to it, there's nothing. It's just that single player campaign, it's going to be fun. Um, you can make completely different decisions, uh, especially with regards to how many polygons are on your characters. Um, so if, if you really want um, super customizable outfits and stuff for your players where they can mix and match everything, and maybe they can even put their own designs on it in an online game, well, that's good. There's going to be some performance impacts on that because now you can't make any assumption that this player can have full sets of a specific loadout or a specific equipment set, right? So you have to, the programmers already have to design around that especially, and then they can't make good decisions or it limits their decision making as well on that. So, um, I know, I seem to come a lot to performance, but I'm a programmer. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, any, I guess any uh, thoughts? I, I think one thing as a if you're just into your art or your design or your code and you don't really care about all that biz goo as my uh, old colleagues used to refer to it but you know yeah okay we're doing a commercial product and it's someone else's job but worry about the money and blah 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 then you can at least think about it like this is I want to put this kick-ass thing in but there's a cost to some other kick-ass thing I won't have time to put in instead, right? And if, so even if you're just entirely focused on your craft or on the game or on the gameplay or the polish, there's still a, a zero sum overall, right, for, for how much time you have. There's only a finite amount of time and talent 
that can happen. So even if you're not concerned, it's not your job to be concerned and you're not wired to be concerned about the money, there's still opportunity costs in terms of creativity. Or even, uh, let's say this uh, you have a feature. Um, I really hate talking in general terms. Um, let's say that you have three UI artists and they all, they're all they multi-talented, they are really good artists, and they can also program, so you don't have to send any programmers over there. Let's say um, you, you, you sort of design the user experience such that it's super customizable. Um, the players, again, the engineers came up with a great solution for the equipment problem, so now you have to come up with, this, with a really nice, elegant UI for well, how are they going to customize pieces of equipment? How are they going to mix and match them? Stuff like that. Um, let's say that two of those uh, designers, for whatever reason, end up saying, hey, you know what? I got a better opportunity elsewhere. Um, or I don't really like making games anymore. You know, it's too much of a time. Or it's not, I mean, um, Making games is a lot of fun. It's much more, it's, it might be even more gratifying, maybe, I don't know, than at the Guild Hall. Um, and that's not really me just saying it. Um, because, I mean, you're, you're here for a reason, right? You enjoy games, you want to make games. Um, I think Capstone is sort, of, is sort of like the epitome of the Guild Hall experience, in some sense, um, where you're actually kind of most of the raids have been let off on you, um, and you get to continue to make mistakes to learn from them. Um, and that is a lot, it gives a lot of sense in what it's like to work in a, in a in an indie company, or even a big studio, depending upon where you are. Um, certainly there's like very big places that have 300 programmers, and they're insane. Um, but no matter where you are, um, you want, your goal is to make a game. Um, you're going to have fun doing it because you've already experienced it here.